Welcome to the 2020 virtual annual meeting. I hope you are all staying well during these challenging times. I'm Laura Magaña, President and CEO of ASPPH, and I'm excited that you are all participating in our virtual annual meeting. The virtual annual meeting is held on Fridays until May 15th, featuring key speakers and selected sessions. And I hope all of you can join to continue our conversations about critical public health issues during these unprecedented times. Each session is being recorded and will be available on our website. Today, our plenary session is Advancing Diversity and Inclusion in Academic Public Health, featuring Dr. Pamela Newkirk. I'm pleased to introduce today's session moderator, Dr. Thomas Laviste, Dean of the Tulane University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. Welcome, Dean Laviste, and now I will turn the session over to you to introduce our presenter. Yes, uh, thank you, Laura, and good afternoon. Thank you, Laura, and good afternoon, everyone. We're glad you can join us for this uh, session of the 2020 ASPPH Virtual Annual Meeting, Advancing Diversity and Inclusion in the Academic and Academic Public Health. I'm Thomas Levis, and I'm Dean of the Tulane University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine, and I'm honored to be the moderator for this session. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to review a few housekeeping items. You can ask questions in writing at any time during the session by clicking on the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. This session is being recorded and the recording will be posted later today. At the conclusion of this webinar, please take a moment to complete the evaluation. Your feedback will help ASPPH continue to provide quality programming. In today's session, we'll be exploring efforts to promote diversity, specifically in academic institutions. This is a topic that's very important for schools and programs of public health, as diversity and inclusion efforts align with their missions and core values to ensure diversity, equity, and excellence in teaching, research, patient care, and community engagement. ASPPH and our members are committed to achieving zero tolerance for harassment and discrimination. In 2017, ASPPH conducted a survey led by Dr. Melanie Goodman from NYU College of Global Public Health to identify efforts to achieve diversity and inclusion within schools and programs of public health, as well as within the larger universities and colleges. Results intent uh, to identify promising practices to build and sustain an inclusive campus that values and respects all individuals. The survey identified strategic areas being addressed at the college and university level. These included improving the campus climate, recruitment, retention, and advancement of engaging, uh, and engaging faculty, staff, and students in reimagining the campus. At the school or program of public health level, diversity and inclusion strategic areas are focused on supporting and maintaining an inclusive climate, recruitment and retention of activities, development of curriculum to better understand health equity and address issues of inclusion and diversity, and understanding of health disparities. Their commitment to diversity and inclusion is reflected in student materials, including application and admissions materials, student handbooks, websites, and course syllabi. Respondents also provided challenges and barriers that limit achieving diversity and inclusion in their school or program of public health. Today, we're honored to have Dr. Pamela Newkirk as our speaker to discuss the decades-long diversity dilemma. Dr. Newkirk is a journalist, professor, author, and scholar whose work explores the consequences of contemporary and historic depictions of African Americans in popular culture. In her recent book, Diversity Inc., The Failed Promise of a Billion Dollar Business, Dr. Newkirk notes that diversity training is harming people of color and not achieving the goal. Today, Dr. Newkirk will be sharing her insights on why this uh, disparate multi-billion dollar initiatives we have not uh, despite multi-billion dollar initiatives, we have not been uh, seeing meaningful strides towards improve, employing and promoting racial minorities. This book was included on Time Magazine's must-read books of 2019. 
Her previous book, Spectacle, The Astonishing Life of Ota Binga, a New York Times Editor's Choice, was awarded the 2016 NAACP Image Award and named Best Book of 2015 by NPR, the Boston Globe, and the San Francisco Chronicle. Prior to joining the journalism faculty at New York University, she was a reporter at four news organizations, including New York Newsday, where she was part of a Pulitzer Prize winning team. Her articles have appeared in leading publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Guardian, and Time Magazine. Welcome, Dr. Newkirk. It's a pleasure to be here. Good meeting over to you. All right, thank you so much. Um, I'm delighted to join you today, uh, and I thank the association for inviting me, Laura. Um, thank you, Dean Levice, and each of you for joining this conversation in the midst of a pandemic. Um, I have been asked to share some of the highlights of my research for Diversity Inc. The Failed Promise of a Billion Dollar Business. As uh, Dean Levy says, the book explores the five decades long effort to diversify American institutions. And my work is informed by my own experience working in daily journalism and in higher education, two realms in which African Americans are radically underrepresented. Despite decades of hand-wringing, costly initiatives, and uncomfortable conversations, progress in most elite American institutions has stalled. While racial and ethnic minorities make up nearly 40% of the national population, they comprise just 17% of full-time university professors, which includes faculty at historically Black colleges and universities. So non-white, non-Hispanic whites who comprise roughly 61% of the national population hold 83% of full-time professorships. Hispanics and blacks who together comprise roughly 31% of the US population are just 3% and 4% respectively of full-time professors. Their numbers have barely budged in decades. The numbers in academia, like those in other influential fields, are telling. Between 2009 and 2018, the percentage of Black law partners has inched up from 1.7% to 1.8%. People of color comprise 8% of law firm partners compared to 75% who are white male and 20% who are women. According to the national, those numbers are from the National Association for Law Placement. Between 1985 and 2016, the proportion of black men in management in all US companies with 100 or more employees barely moved from 3% to 3.2%. 3 3 so this underrepresentation defies the quickening pace of change in the nation's racial demographics. In 2011, for the first time in America's nearly 250 year history, more babies of color were born than non-Hispanic whites. Since 2010, non-Hispanic whites have been the minority in 22 of the nation's 100 largest metropolitan areas. And the Census Bureau projects that by 2045, they will no longer constitute a national majority. So I, I wanted to examine why after five decades of countless studies, public pledges, and high profile initiatives, diversity is still lagging in most influential fields. And I wanted to interrogate the tension between the rhetoric and the billions of dollars institutions annually spend on diversity czars and consultants, training programs, climate surveys, and the consistently disappointing numbers. In the brief time I have, I'll outline some of the factors that contribute to the current diversity landscape in higher education. How colleges and universities have responded and what they might do differently to achieve greater diversity. 
Our current diversity conversation grew out of the 1960s civil rights movement and President Lyndon Johnson's efforts through his great society programs to fold African Americans into the main of American life. For the first time, African Americans were hired by institutions that had historically excluded them. Since then, diversity, of course, has been expanded to encompass other racial and ethnic minorities, along with women, people with physical and mental disabilities, sexual orientation, and other marginalized populations. A survey of 771 chief diversity officers found that 63% had difficulty even arriving at a common definition for diversity on their campus. Ideas range from simply valuing difference to social justice for those who have been historically excluded and disadvantaged. In 2018, Denise Young Smith, Apple's first ever Vice President of Inclusion in Diversity, took the ever evolving definition of diversity to the extreme. On a panel on diversity, she suggested that 12 blue eyed blonde white men could also illustrate diversity due to their different backgrounds. When asked whether she would focus on underrepresented minorities and specifically black women, Smith, who is black, responded, quote, I focus on everyone. Diversity is the human experience. I get a little frustrated when diversity is tagged to people of color or the women or the LGBT, close quote. So the elasticity of the term has rendered it, along with the goals it's, attending, it's intended to accomplish, opaque. As diversity has for many institutions become untethered from the history and legacy of racial injustice, the plight of racial minorities in general and African Americans in particular has been eclipsed. Overlooked too are the ways in which racial minorities become doubly and triply burdened by interlocking systems of discrimination related to physical and cognitive disability, gender and sexual orientation. So to be clear, I explore the issue of racial diversity and focus however imperfectly on the three largest racial ethnic minority groups, Hispanics or Latinx, African Americans slash Black and Asian Americans. However, the disparities between Blacks and Whites remain the most telling indicator of America's racial breach. In examining the data and conversing with scores of people on the front line of the movement for change, I discovered some of the, some of the reasons why, despite decades of deliberation, and costly initiatives many are still pondering and gesturing rather than meaningfully increasing racial diversity. While these are complex issues that are not easily boiled down to bullet points, I will nonetheless attempt to cite the five biggest takeaways from my research that helps explain why colleges and universities have not made greater strides. First and foremost um, on my is custom and culture. Um, so the legacy of racial hierarchies that are stamped into their American ethos, this enduring ideology of white preeminence that permeates mass media, so-called high art, the Western literary canon, and education curriculum from grade school through higher education is probably the most, um, the, 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 the overarching reason why we are not really achieving diversity. The dismal numbers reported year after year are a predictable outcome of embedded racial attitudes and dominant narratives that define our culture. Much of the unrest we've seen on college campuses in recent years is a reaction to the ways in which this ethos is expressed in the composition of the faculty and student body in campus iconography, or the racial illiteracy and historical amnesia that pervades the curriculum. In the wake of tragic events in Charlottesville, Kurt Von Dock, a history professor and assistant dean at UVA, said the year 2017 was a wake-up call for white Americans 
who have not seriously confronted the vexed history of race. Quote, Charlottesville is known as a white progressive place, but there's a pretty unpleasant story dealing with slavery and segregation, he said. What we're wrestling with is a microcosm of what America has not come to terms with since the civil rights movement. It so powerfully shapes the world we're in, he said. So this white denial about the ways in which the past continues to inform the present is perhaps the biggest impediment to diversity. The belief by many whites that racial equality has been achieved and that minorities receive undue advantage perverts how many institutions define excellence, merit, scholarship, and set institutional priorities. We're left with curricula that often fail to acknowledge how racial illiteracy and historical amnesia has impoverished our offerings, undermined students' capacity for empathy, and left Americans unable to grasp the underlying causes of racial disparities and injustice today. Institutions cannot hope to achieve true diversity without meaningfully addressing the ways in which their own history so palpably informs the present. The, present. the debates over iconography are less about ana anachronistic relics than they are about the values and ideals that they express today. Number two is social networks. We live in a rigorously segregated society. People in the academy, like those in other influential fields, often hire people from their exclusive social networks, which often exclude people of color. At colleges and universities, faculty search committees generally have wide latitude to reach out to anyone they deem suitable or desirable to join the faculty. Hiring, then, is a subjective process, and candidate finalists typically mirror the networks of those leading the search. Searches often result in the hiring of friends, friends of friends, and former colleagues, or people whose backgrounds, scholarly interests, and sensibilities mirror those of the committee members. The candidates then tend to reflect the overwhelmingly white composition of the faculty. Add to this process of self-referential decision-making, the network of influential people who are then asked to write letters of recommendation which leaves all but a small number of racial minorities out of the loop. For junior level prospective candidates whose scholarship challenges white norms and views embedded in Eurocentric canons, the odds are especially long. Moreover, once schools do prioritize diversity, many attempt to recruit the same cadre of proven stars in their fields while overlooking emerging scholars of color in the pipeline. As a result, the same superstars of color are recycled and moved between schools, while the overwhelming number of underrepresented faculty remain unchanged. The bidding wars over this handful of star faculty further stokes resentment among some white faculty and fuels the sense of uh, feels the sense that racial minorities are the ones who receive preferential treatment. It's a vicious cycle that for decades has helped maintain the status quo. Number three, diversity practices. While many schools have in recent years hired chief diversity officers and instituted diversity programs, there's a growing body of scholarship that suggests much of the training mandated by thousands of institutions don't work, and in some instances do more harm than good. And I should repeat that the training doesn't work and often does more harm than good. Quote, strategies for controlling bias which drive most diversity efforts have failed spectacularly. And that uh, is a quote from Harvard professor Frank Dobbin, and Tel Aviv professor Alev Alexandra, who, who concluded in their study, 
who drew these conclusions in their study, Why Diversity Programs Fail, which was published in the Harvard Business Review in 2016. Noting the lack of progress in management of black men since 1985 and white women since 2000, they wrote, quote, it isn't that there aren't enough educated women and minorities out there. Both groups have made huge educational gains over the past two generations. The problem is that we can't motivate people by forcing them to get with the program and punishing them if they don't." Close quote. Dobbin and Aleph, both professors of sociology, examined three decades of data from 800 U.S. firms and interviewed hundreds of managers and executives. They found that mandatory training, which they described as, quote, command and control approaches, often trigger a backlash, particularly among white men. And rather than being converted, they often react with anger and resi resistance. Even more troubling is the adverse impact mandatory training appears to have on those it's intended to help. Five years after instituting training, they found that on average, the number of black women in management dropped 9.2%, and the numbers for Asian women and men, respectively, decreased 5.4 and 4.3%. Quote, many interpreted the key learning point as having to walk on eggshells around women and minorities, choosing words carefully so not to offend. Executives uh, Rohini Anand and Mary Frances Winters wrote in a 2008 article on diversity training in the Academy of Management and Learning and Education. Another study, Preju Prejudice Reduction, What Works, a Review and Assessment of Research, is one of the most comprehensive studies on the efficacy of diversity programs. It examined 893 published and unpublished reports interventions intended to reduce prejudice over a five-year period. The interventions included workplace diversity initiatives, multicultural education, dialogue groups, media campaigns, and cognitive training intended, intended to combat bias related to a wide range of targets including race, religion, age, weight, and attitudes towards diversity and multiculturalism. According to the authors, Elizabeth Levy Palak at Harvard's uh, Center for International Affairs and Donald Green of Yale's Institution for Social and Public Policies, quote, the strongest conclusion to be drawn from the field exper experimental literature on prejudice reduction concerns the dearth of evidence for most prejudice reduction programs. Few programs originating in scientific laboratories, nonprofits, or educational organizations government bureaus and consulting firms have been evaluated rigorously, they wrote. They add that entire genres of interventions, including organizational diversity training um, and, and the like, have not been tested. So they wrote, quote, one can argue that diversity training workshops succeed because they break down stereotypes and encourage empathy Alternatively, one can argue that such workshops in reinforce stereotypes and elicit resistance among the most prejudiced participants. Neither of these conflicting arguments is backed up by the type of evidence that would convince a skeptic. So they concluded, quote, we currently do not know whether a wide range of programs and policies tend to work on average and we are quite far from having an empirically grounded understanding of the conditions under which these programs work best. So they found that the positive effects of diversity training at best last a day or two, and even then can create backlash. So there's little evidence that the initiatives most commonly employed by most institutions work yet they continue to spend billions each year with little to show for it. And it begs the question, why are institutions doing the same thing and expecting different results? Number four, the diversity backlash. 
following the civil rights movement, America had, made, had begun to make tremendous strides, closing the racial gap in income and education. However, by the end of the 1970s, affirmative action gave way to cries of reverse discrimination. In 1978, in Baki versus University of California, the US Supreme Court narrowly ruled in favor of Alan Baki, who, as you know, was a white student who sued the University of California Medical School for reserving 16 out of 100 seats for racial minorities. In a 5-4 decision, the, the Supreme Court struck down the use of racial quotas in college admissions, saying they violated the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. Writing for the majority, Supreme Court Justice Lewis Powell explained, quote, there is a measure of inequity in forcing innocent persons in Baki's position to bear the burdens of redressing grievances not of their making, close quote. The ruling meant that past discrimination of disadvantaged groups could no longer be considered in admission decisions. The Baki decision was followed in 1981 with the dismantlement of federal anti-discrimination programs under the Reagan administration. Uh, affirmative action continued to be vilified even after quotas were, were eliminated. By the 1980s, many of the gains made during the 1960s and 70s, including school integration, were erased along with federal policies that had begun to effectively close the education and poverty gap. And this was done without whites losing ground. The backlash extended beyond education. As historian Carol Anderson recounts in her book, White Rage, Black unemployment had sharply declined between the 1960s and 1970s, ne nearly closing the racial gap. However, under the Reagan administration, federal jobs and education programs that had aided the pro that progress were cut, causing Black unemployment to skyrocket to 15.5%, the highest it had been since the Great Depression. Black youth unemployment rose to 45.7%. Reagan then slashed the training, employment, and labor services budget by 70%, a total of $3.8 billion, causing college enrollment among African Americans to tumble from 34% to 26%. Quote, thus, just at the moment when the post-industrial economy made an undergraduate degree more important than ever, 15,000 fewer African Americans were in college uh, during the early 1980s than had been the case in the mid 1970s, Anderson wrote. These attacks had an immediate effect on the diversity of the college student body. After California's passage in 1996 of Proposition 209, which abolished affirmative action programs in state hiring, contracting and college admissions, minority admissions plummeted 61% at UC Berkeley and 36% at UCLA. Similarly, the percentage of Rice University's freshman class dropped 36% after Texas eliminated affirmative action programs. Then, of course, in Fisher versus University of Texas, the Supreme Court was once again asked to intervene in race-based admission policies after Abigail Fisher, a white student, sued after she was denied admission. In, the def in, their de in its defense, the university cited a 2002 study showing that 79% of university courses had one or no African Americans enrolled, and 30% had one or no Hispanics. In 2013, the Supreme Court upheld the university's use of race, but cited a standard of strict scrutiny, which requires the university to prove to the court that race-neutral policies were attempted. Columbia University President Lee Bollinger said diversity has become an abstract con concept due to, to the Supreme Court's 1978 Bakke decision and the many decisions that have followed. Of course, the Bakke decision prevents universities from seeking remedies for past discrimination, even though it is precisely that history that affirmative action policies attempted to redress. Quote, 
We're deprived of the context that gave it a sense of mission, Bollinger said. Quote, every college leader is told, do not refer to history. I think we have a meaningless, abstract conversation about diversity without a rationale. Close quote. The ongoing backlash to diversity continues to undermine progress, and we're seeing it everywhere. Uh, the universities of Tennessee and Nebraska are among the state universities that have sought to defund or downsize diversity programs. Last year, Mark Perry, a white economics professor at the University of Michigan, filed a complaint with the Department of Education Office for Civil Rights against one state university for hosting a summer workshop for Black Girls Code. The nonprofit seeks to address the virtually absence of Blacks and, and particularly Black women in the burgeoning tech industry by introducing them to coding. Diversity or the lack thereof, oh, okay, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm racing ahead of myself. Uh, and so number five on my list of uh, the reasons why we're not seeing uh, more progress in, in uh, diversifying our campuses is uh, leadership. Uh, diversity or the lack thereof is primarily a leadership issue. While the diversity apparatus, task forces, studies, officers, consultants suggest that achieving diversity is rocket science, my research shows that achieving it primarily requires committed leadership and intention. Instead, many institutional leaders have farmed the problem out to consultants or chief diversity officers who are often marginalized within the institution. Said Bollinger, quote, you have to believe in a principle of justice. There hasn't been enough pushback on the abstraction of diversity. You have to make it front and center. I think it's a matter of intention. If it's a pipeline issue, you have to work on the pipeline. The entire institution has to be behind it. Left to its own devices, it won't happen, close quote. Bollinger says it comes down to valuing diversity as something that's good for society. Quote, I think you have to have a civil rights consciousness in order to have this really work. You have to believe in a principle of justice. Every institution should speak to this. Instead, we've hidden from it. We talk about diversity as if, it, as if it's detached from history. I would argue, I would urge everyone to say it because it needs to be said. I think we've allowed this loss of memory to take hold and the people opposed to it to set the agenda." Close quote. So I've spent most of the time explaining why we don't have more diversity, but I'll, I'll close with the good news. And, and that is that there are successful models that can be replicated, including uh, just simple, the simple acts of mentoring and targeted diversity hiring initiatives that many institutions fail to pursue. I'd be happy to, to discuss some of the strategies that have borne fruit uh, during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Newkirk. I'll start the Q&A portion of the call with a few questions uh, for you. We'll also have time to answer questions from the audience. As a reminder, attendees can en enter your question by clicking on the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. Please do not use the chat feature. So my first question is uh, to Dr. Newkirk is in the, in the book, you reference successful models, for example, um, Coca-Cola, and you ended your presentation alluding to successful models. Uh, in addition, you recognize that schools have long been the battleground on which issues of race and social mobility have been waged. What made the efforts uh, led by Coca-Cola successful? And what should we, as schools and programs of public health, do differently? So first, why did, why did Coca-Cola succeed? Okay, so um, just a, a little background. Coca-Cola uh, was sued uh, for racial discrimination. And as a result of a, a, a settlement, 
um, it, it agreed to a number of measures. Um, and one was to have um, a, a kind of a task force that's, that, that oversaw um, the, the, the initiatives that it would, um, it would take to, to increase diversity. And the reason why I found uh, that case study so helpful is because it showed um, in a very transparent way um, just how a major uh, company went from, from not having diversity and, and, and how it, it moved to be one of uh, the more diverse companies in, in, um, in corporate America. And I think one of the key takeaways from, from that case was um, that they had transparent metrics. So they had a chief diversity officer who, who examined um, all of the metrics across the company, everything um, related to employee hiring, promotions, bonuses, um, and, they, and they tracked these metrics along racial lines, along gender lines. And so, in, in looking at um, just what was going on, they were able to detect patterns of bias and they were able to disrupt those patterns in real time. So before um, a job offer was even made, they were looking at um, any potential disparities in, 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 in pay and um, they were looking at the candidate pool and, and whether it was a diverse candidate pool. So there was just like total transparency and, and it allowed them um, to, to actually look at what was going on, um, you know, beneath the radar, uh, things that you would not just see on the surface. And I think it's probably one of the most instructive uh, uh, things that that institutional leaders can could can borrow, um, because it, it's kind of telling that a, a recent study showed that most uh, chief diversity officers, in fact, only thirty five percent, even have access to the metrics in in the institutions that they're working in, and without without being able to even diagnose the problem, there, there's almost no way that you can hope, hope to, to fix uh, what ails that institution. It's like you're shooting in the dark. So I, I think it's, it's probably one of the, the more um, important takeaways from that case study. And the other is um, along with the transparency was intention. Um, my last, my last, uh, uh, bullet point was the importance of an, a, a commitment from leadership. So there was a true commitment from leadership and, and they, they, it was like an all hands on deck uh, uh, initiative. Mm -hmm. so, so given that, what, what should we do as leaders of schools and programs in public health? Which strategies do you see as, as uh, being most likely to have uh, the desired outcome? Yeah, well, as I said, uh, with institutional leadership, you can move mountains. Um, this this diversity problem can almost uh, be be solved overnight uh, with the with the kind of intention that we see uh, that we saw at Coca Cola that we see even at Columbia University. When you have commitment and you have leaders who are um, uh, kind of expressing those ideals in, in their own behaviors. It's, they go beyond the rhetoric um, and they're not marginalizing the people who are charged with actually um, resolving this issue. Um, in, in many of the institutions that, we, we, that I looked at, um, diversity professionals feel pretty marginalized in, in, the, in the institutions that they work in. And without, um, really integrating this into the main of, of the institution, it's just not going to work. So that's why I, I think it's a real leadership issue because we can have all of the strategies in the world, but without that kind of intentionality and commitment, uh, we're not gonna be able to, to fix this. Mm -hmm. So uh, many of the schools have appointed positions such as you know, chief diversity officer or associate dean for diversity and inclusion, equity and inclusion, things like that. 
do you do, in in your in your research do you see that those those appointments are successful or should we be appointing people to roles like that or should this be should this issue of diversity equity and inclusion be the province of the the dean the leader himself or herself right so the problem is less that institutions are hiring these chief diversity officers um, the bigger problem is that they're hiring them, but not really giving them the resources to actually promote change. Um, and the, as I say, that they're, they're pretty marginalized in most of, of, of these institutions. Um, as long as, and most of these chief diversity officers come from the most marginalized groups in society. So you have marginalized people in these marginalized roles. And it, it goes back to the leadership. If, if, you know, people know when it matters, when there are, are uh, rewards for achieving a goal and when it really doesn't matter, when it's just rhetoric and window dressing. So it, leadership is really, really key. I, ca I cannot overstate that. So I have a number of questions that have come in from the audience and I want to turn to some of those questions. One is, uh, could you give a few examples about how diversity programs do more harm than good? Could you elaborate a bit on that point? Yeah, well, um, I cited that Harvard study, um, which would show that over time, after, after diversity training, the percentage uh, in the number of Black women and Asians in particular actually decreased. Um, I know from my own experience the kind of resentment that these programs, particularly mandatory programs, um, fuel uh, uh, among whites. And um, the research shows that it's particularly white men who are, who are most irked um, by, by uh, these training sessions. And, you know, I say this um, kind of uh, with humor, but, but it is kind of true that if you told me that on Monday, morning, um, you're going to train me on how to, um, how to behave in the workplace, how, how, how to treat my white colleagues, I might want to call in sick that day. Um, you know, the workplace is not where uh, people come to learn the things that they, the, the kind of values that should have been instilled at home, in the church, uh, in the school. Um, so I, I think it, it, it presents a problem and also the research is showing, you know, uh, study after study is showing that there's no evidence to support uh, the, the, the efficacy of, of, of these, these programs. So I, I think we need to um, move away from the strategies that have proven to fail. Um, you know, as I say, we, we're doing the same thing and, ex and expecting different results. And we need to instead look at some of the models that have borne fruit. Mm -hmm. But so you, you make the point that one of the problems is that there's a, a, a cultural, uh, so, so there's sort of a cultural embeddedness of uh, supremacy yes. in many institutions. And it's really in the DNA of these organizations. In some cases, universities that were established um, to, to bolster white supremacy. That were, that, uh, yeah, in the overwhelming majority of cases, um, the institutions were formed around, um, you know, bolstering white supremacy, slavery, um, you know, and, and they, they provided the rationale for these racial hierarchies that as, as you know, have been embedded into um, the, the nation's DNA. And I don't think that there is an, enough acknowledgement of the ways in which uh, that history echoes in, in our, our current, you know, deliberations on, on, in the, on the college campus. Um, you know, until we seriously confront the ways in which you know, the, these ideas around racial supremacy were not, they didn't, they didn't come from the bottom up. These ideas were taught 
um, in places like Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Oxford University. Um, the, the, the whole field of anthropology was based on this, this foundation of, of racial uh, inferiority of Africans and the superiority of Northern uh, uh, Europeans. And I don't think most institutions have seriously confronted that history in the way, in the, in the way it echoes and um, the prevalent ideology today. But, but given the embeddedness of racial su superior supremacy, right? And, um, and, but you said there's, a, and, and the fact that we really haven't as a, as a society engaged the history, I'm often shocked by the degree to which Americans, well-educated Americans in other areas are uneducated about the history of race in this country. But, but given that we have those two impediments, how do we disrupt that if we don't do some sort of training or educational intervention? Well, I think in, in you know, we're educators, right? And um, I, I think there is a, we need to kind of re-examine our curriculum, uh, curricula. Uh, there, there needs to be um, more thought given to the ways in which entire populations have been excised from you know, history, um, how episodes and events in, in, in history, critical events are, are not taught. Um, so yeah, I, I, that's less training than it is actual education. And I think with greater diversity, you begin to address this by filling in the void of uh, these, these lapses with scholars who are doing this work, who can help us um, you know, close the, this void um, in, in, in our offerings uh, to students. So, yeah, it's, um, it, it, the, you know, the problem with training, besides the fact that we know it, it doesn't work, this is not something that you can do in an hour or two hours. <laughs> you know, there, there are whole um, realms of scholarship that need to be engaged in these institutions. So this is this this goes beyond uh, training. This goes at the, the 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 whole issue of education, and and it has to begin well before people enter the college classroom. This is this is a matter that implicates us all, and it it needs to begin in the lower grades and work its way through the high school so that by the time students reach uh, the college classroom, you don't have this pronounced racial illiteracy that, that is really perverting our, our entire um, educational system. Well, I for one certainly agree with that. And I, and I would think many of the, in the audience uh, agree as well, but for most of us, we don't, we don't encounter these students until they are in college, right? right. At the very youngest, maybe freshman year of college. By then, uh, I assume you would agree, they, they've already adopted whatever attitudes and beliefs they're, they're going to adopt. So, so how do we intervene? How do we make a difference? Mm -hmm. if, unless we're going to use sort of their, their um, knowledge of, of, of racial history in this country, as an admissions criteria, how, how, do we, how do we intervene? How do we disrupt this? I, I, th I think with the greater awareness of the problem that this is creating in, in our institutions, it, it, you know, it really does go back to leadership, right? Um, valuing diversity would allow us to have uh, to open the window on these, these areas of scholarship that have not been seriously engaged. Um, institutional leaders could create a climate for these kind of conversations and the need for these kinds of interventions. Um, you know, as, as uh, President Bollinger says, that there has to be just this um, appreciation for the value of diversity. We're not talking about just uh, counting heads and, 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 and looking at, you know, what what diversity looks like. We're talking about really educating ourselves and our students on the ways in which history is informing persisting uh, inequality, um, racial disparities today. 
um, until we can begin to connect those dots, until we have these conversations where we're confronting um, um, our history, uh, the complicity of, of many institutions in persisting inequality and, and uh, injustice, we're, we're not going to move the needle on this because this is a confrontation that needs to happen. And I think leaders are the people we should turn to, to find ways to address this situation. This is a leadership issue. So an, an interesting uh, question came in. Yeah. Your point about closing the void in curriculum is well taken. In addition to scholarship that increases racial illiteracy and explicitly with specific courses, are there models that infuse this into foundational curriculum or into cross-cutting curriculum? Yeah, there are a number of schools that are working to do just that. Um, to instead of having these courses, as many of us do, uh, where it's a, it's a, a extracurricular or it's a, you know it's an elective where you can learn about the history of race, um, you can learn uh, you know things that are not um, required. How do we begin to infuse some of our required courses with this kind of um, literacy um, and, and, and to kind of erase or, or to address this historical amnesia that um, allows many people to be blinded to the ways in which this history is still with us. I'd like to get your reaction to a different, a, a different topic. So in, in uh, the chapter focused on course correction, you, you highlight a pilot pipeline program with Columbia Medical School funded by the Robert Johnson Foundation. So are, are pipeline programs effective? Well, yeah, pipeline, we need pipeline programs, but you know, as I think there's so much um, emphasis on pipeline and we need to, you know, walk and chew gum at the same time. So we need pipeline programs for sure. But I don't want that to overshadow the extent to which we have people who have, who are already in the pipeline who are not being hired, whose, whose scholarship is not being valued. Um, so, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, when we began this conversation about diversity, the pipeline may have been the key issue um, in, in, in many uh, fields. Today, the pipeline is really less of a problem. Um, we still need to, of course, work on the pipeline always. But the problem is still, what are we valuing in these institutions? What kind of scholarship are we looking for? Who do we want as our colleagues? Um, so, so I just don't want people to um, think that we don't have more diversity because we don't have enough people in the pipeline. Yes, we, could, we should continue to work on the pipeline, but we already have people in the pipeline whose uh, contributions are not being valued in the way that they need to be um, to reflect uh, you know, the, the, the kind of diversity that is our society, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, we, pipeline, yes, for sure. But diversity, we can start working on that today because the pipeline suggests that we're talking about something that we, that we may see results in years to you know, in years to come, but we can begin to increase diversity today. Yeah, you do. So, you do somewhat have a chicken and egg problem. So yeah. How do you build a pipeline unless you have some, unless you have people in position to build it? You know, to kind of nurture and develop those people that are coming along through the pipeline. You know, kind of makes me think about a a, a visit I had to an institution, uh, university. Uh, recently, that had a pretty impressive, uh, pretty impressive diversity among its undergraduate population. You know, large number of first generation mm -hmm. college, students, large number of Latinx students, and really impressive. And so, when I asked them about the diversity of their lack of diversity of their faculty and their graduate school program, the answer I got was pipeline. 
Right. And I was like, you know what? Yeah, I can buy the pipeline arg argument in many other places. But I look out that window and I see all of these students walking around, undergraduate students walking around your campus. You know, why don't you just grab one of them, drag them into your office and say, if you listen to me in seven years, you'll be a professor at this university because the universities are the factories that produce the faculty. Exactly. So in many cases, we have merely to turn on the assembly line and just make our own. We, that's what we do. Right, and there and there are there are institutions that are doing that. Um, you know, there are pipeline programs that New York University has one. Um, Yale, uh, I'm sure many many uh, institutions are now um, developing these pipeline programs, which still are you know looking at a small number of um, of, of students. Um, but given the small number of uh, faculty at these institutions, it doesn't take big numbers to dramatically shift those percentages. That's very true. And, and that's, that's such a good point. And it reminds me uh, to, to also stress that we see the least amount of diversity in the more elite fields uh, um, in the academy, places where you have small numbers of people. And it's where you could uh, you you could change things far more dramatically, but it's where change is is happening at a much slower pace because of there's so many issues that contribute to this, and you know, beginning with social networks, uh, with comfort levels, with um, what what is perceived as excellence and in, in scholarship, and and on and on. But yeah, we could move the needle pretty rapidly. Uh, with the kind of commitment that that we see in places where they have um, fostered that kind of change. So can you talk a little bit about these pipeline programs that, you, that have been successful? What are the elements of those programs? If we were going to create a pipeline program, either across the schools here or even within the individual schools, we wanted to do it at our own place. What should we do? How should we set these programs up? What are best practices that that we can look at to ensure that, that they're successful? Right, well, you're looking at um, students, you know, you're looking at excellence, you're looking at students with the potential uh, uh, to, to join a faculty at some point. Um, we're looking at mentoring. You know, it's, it's funny that, that mentoring is probably one of the, the, the most undervalued uh, ways to uh, help achieve diversity, not, not only in um, retention, but in, in helping to grow um, diverse faculty. Uh, it's just so undervalued and it, it, it could mean so much. You know, I, I recently um, gave a talk uh, at, at Discover, uh, the, the financial services in Chicago, and during the Q&A, uh, someone said that she had worked there for five years and but she very rarely talked to her black colleagues because she was afraid she didn't know what to say and that's kind of an illuminating and honest um, uh, you know um, sentiment that helps explain why mentorship um, it, it is is a is a real problem oftentimes for people of color because of this discomfort around race. Many people are just left on their own. Then they're, they're not mentored in the same way. So I think when we're talking about pipeline programs, there has to be a real commitment to developing um, uh, you know the, these future these future scholars. Mm -hmm. And that this. this it, interesting. I've also noticed in some cases that that unwillingness to engage race or even engage conversations around it can also happen among the racial and ethnic minority in themselves. So I've noticed in many cases at universities where black students won't talk to other black students for fear of giving the impression that they're congregating only among their group and that they're being that they're segregating, which means they can't support them, each other, and which makes it an even more isolating experience. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's a problem, and, and you know, and that goes for even chief diversity officers. There, there have been um, studies that have shown that uh, when people of color promote diversity, they they're penalized when 
but whites are considered more objective. So white men in particular, even white women, um, when they are perceived as, as uh, promoting diversity, there could be consequences in the, in the workplace. So yeah, it's, it's still, you know, at the end of the day, as I say, this is an all hands on deck kind of uh, problem that needs to be resolved. And I think it's going to take um, the commitment of our, our white colleagues um, as well as people of color. But I mean, there is that fear of, of appearing um, uh, committed to diversity when you are yourself diverse. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're, we're pretty much out of time at this point, but um, I'd, I'd love to continue to have this conversation. Tell, uh, can, can you give me, give me a takeaway? What, what would you like this audience to take away from this, from this conversation? Well, what I want people mostly to take away is that this is not an insurmountable problem. Um, we can do this. There are models. And um, those, for those who are truly committed to this, we can, we can look at, um, you know, we could set realistic timetables and actually see progress with, with a true commitment to this. Uh, and it's probably the most important takeaway because I think there is this perception that this is somehow out of reach, like it's so hard, it's rocket science. But it, it really is a, a problem that, that we, we created and, and we can solve. And uh, I'd like you to close with this. I've been asked, several questions have come in asking, can you give the name of your book, <laughs> how, they can, how people can get a copy of it? Oh, that's very kind. Uh, I happen to have a copy right here. Uh, so the book is Diversity Inc., The Failed Promise of a Billion Dollar Business. And it is available on Amazon, BarnesandNoble.com, um, wherever books are sold. And for the record, that may have looked like we planned that, but we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I don't regard, uh, we, uh, again, I want to thank Dr. Newkirk for sharing her expertise today and thank all of you for your attention and thoughtful questions. A recording of this webinar will be available shortly on the ASPPA website. Uh, as you close out of the session, please take a moment to complete a very brief session survey. Zoom will display it on your web browser. Finally, displayed on this slide are the upcoming ASPPH virtual annual meeting sessions, which you can learn more about on the ASPPH website. This concludes today's webinar, and thank you all for joining.